Good to see everybody here tonight. We got this on. Is this working? Can you hear that? No. No, you like that, don't you? No. I don't know. Is that is that better? Not much, Dean. It's on. Yes, sir. It's on. It's. I don't know. You're gonna. We got nothing. It's plugged in. It's up. Yeah. Well, good thing Bob doesn't need one. <laughs> Might be hard for people watching online, though, to hear anything. You getting it? Ooh, well, there we go. All right. Wow, now we really got it, don't we? Okay, 195. Take your songbook. Let's sing it together. 195, down at the cross where my Savior died. Glory to his name. 195, let's stand together to sing it. Bob will lead us tonight. On that first together, down at the cross where my Savior died, down where for cleansing from sin I cried, there to my heart was the blood applied, glory to his name, glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. tonight uh the children are going to sing that was your cue to come in on that last chorus there you missed your cue all right so they'll come in now get lined up we'll pray and we'll hear from them this evening all right looking good great wonderful all right let's pray together shall we our Heavenly Father, we thank you now for this evening. Thank you, Lord, for another opportunity to gather together here. Lord, thank you for each one who's made their way to be in the service this evening. Father, we pray you'll meet with us now. Bless the children as they sing. Lord, I pray that uh, we'll receive a blessing from that, and you'll help each one to do their very best. Lord, and remember the verses, remember the songs that they've learned, and may they sing from their heart as unto you. And may you meet with us and give us what we need in this midweek service. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you may be seated.
Great job. Fantastic. Well, let's turn over to 285 in your hymnal. 285, what a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. 285. Let's sing that first all together. What a fellowship, what a joy divine. letters from the Sykes family, missionaries to Venezuela. <clears throat> Greetings from beautiful Venezuela once again. We have had record heat lately, so we are very thankful for our air conditioners. Just, just a short time outside and you feel the full brunt of the heat. The last two months have been extremely focused on working on our visa process. We were out of status at the end of August, so we have been working with a contact in Caracas to pursue a resident status. Resident status in Venezuela is not an easy process. We have already made one trip to Caracas only to be told by 100% of the people that a visa is not available for us. We have been told that we must return to the States and wait there for one to two years until our visas are possibly approved. Thankfully, we have a contact in Caracas who has over 40 years working in the system. And when we were not able to schedule a meeting with one high level person, he was able to help us write a letter to another. We still ask serious prayer in this matter. This Wednesday afternoon, my coworker and I will be flying from Barquiza Meadow, Venezuela to Caracas with a letter in hand to present to another immigration department. This time, our Caracas contact will be accompanying us in the meeting. He has many long-standing relationships as he worked in this area in Caracas for over 40 years. Our prayer is that this will be the avenue for us to finally be able to achieve residency. If we can get our first residency stamp and our passports, 
subsequent renewals will be much easier. It is the first time that the first time that is very difficult. Residency would open up so many doors for us that currently make life a challenge. We cannot have a bank account, so we must live with cash. This is very dangerous. We have heard stories of people being killed for 2,000 bolivars. That is literally just over $2. Inflation continues to drive the prices of imported goods up tremendously. When our co-workers arrived, the exchange for the dollar was around 60 per dollar. The current exchange is nearly 800. We have seen prices skyrocket. This makes even small things more expensive and therefore demands that we carry more cash than normal. Please pray for our safety in this matter. As soon as we have residency, we can get bank accounts and this will make life more safe on many levels and we can make many purchases with a bank card. Ironically, this is the best place we could possibly be. Faith is not easy. It is an action word. Faith that we need when we need it. Emotionally, we have been fairly stable throughout this process. There are moments of anxiety, but we have been reminded through God's word that he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and there is no one who can stand against him. Throughout this process as well, we have learned to surrender the final answer to God. God knows our heart and that we love Venezuela. We have so many ministry opportunities currently and so many people to whom we are currently reaching out to. In the end, we want what God wants, and we are resting in his sovereign hand. This is an opportunity for all of us to see God's hand. This is an opportunity for all of us to grow in our faith. God already, already has done a tremendous work in getting us here, and I believe he continues to keep the door open for us. Please pray for God's grace in the coming days as I meet with the important people in Caracas regarding our papers. Continue to pray for protection as we minister, and as always, we thank you for your investment, both financially as well as spiritually in our lives. God is awesome, and he is doing some great things. The Sykes. Amen. I like his spirit. Not obstacles, they're opportunities to see God do something. Isn't that good? And uh, pray for them, and pray for that visa situation. They'll be able to get that uh, resident status, Okay. All right, uh, you got your prayer guide with you tonight. Anybody did do, does not have one, did not get one, we'll get one to you right away. Just put your hand up. Everybody covered? Very good. All right. We'll start in the back with the coming events. And before we get into all that, let me remind you that uh, the fellowship hall is closed, okay? Uh, there's a wedding on Friday, and they have to get everything set in there. And so we appreciate uh, just... Uh, everybody staying clear of the fellowship hall so they can get that all set for the wedding. Uh, they have a rehearsal tomorrow and the wedding on Friday, and um, so we appreciate your cooperation with that and stay out of the fellowship hall, all right? Um, the RU Inside down at CRC Prison tomorrow and uh, 6.30 to 8.30, and appreciate your prayers for that. And then, of course, the wedding is on Friday at 4.30 in the afternoon right here at the church, and we'll have Reformers Unanimous as usual at 7 p.m. Uh, here in the auditorium uh, tomorrow evening. The RU Inside, Saturday morning out at London Correctional Institution, and of course our bus visitation and soul winning at 10 a.m. on Saturday morning as well. Remember the 10th will be the bonfire and hayride at the Manning Farm. Sign-up sheet for that's downstairs on the table. And then the 18th is Old Fashioned Sunday, all right, and that'll be dinner on the grounds, and we'll have a great time on Old Fashioned Sunday, okay? Um, if you look inside of the sheet, we have our praise report, and uh, of course, we're glad Leland Hamilton came to join our church on Sunday morning, and we had 48 last Thursday night down at CRC, and uh, there were 17 saved on Thursday evening, a great, great crowd, and uh, uh, God's doing some good things there. Uh, 13 Saturday morning out at London, and uh, good reports there of men being faithful and uh, continue to pray for that. That's a that's a different dynamic, and we're finding that what we what we need to pray for is that not only would guys come, but they'd be willing to get up and come. Uh, Saturday mornings is kind of their time. You know what I mean? They they can sleep in. There's uh, there's other things going on, but I think it's just a matter of getting up and getting to the meeting by 8:30 on a Saturday morning, and uh, the mentality is, it's my day to 
sleep in, not do anything, not go anywhere. And uh, I think that's what we're up against there. So pray that uh, that'll guys will get motivated uh, to come and be part of Reformers Unanimous there. All right. Um, of course, our different church ministries and requests uh, right up underneath health there. You see the last name there, Reva Woods in hospice. That was Bob Wallace's sister. She went home to be with the Lord this morning. And uh, so continue to pray for her family and uh, others that will be traveling in probably for the service. Do you know anything about that yet, Brother Bob? Still pending on when the service will be. And so uh, please keep the family in prayer and those who'd be traveling home to West Virginia for that service, okay? And uh, the others on the list here with the health needs, we pray for these in authority. Uh, those in our military, uh, these who are battling cancer, and of course, uh, these on our salvation list and praying for God to bring someone in their life that they'll listen to and they'll give them the gospel and they could be saved. The unreached people groups and uh, the brand new list here to pray for this week. And then our missionaries highlighted, of course, by the Sykes family to Venezuela and especially their visa issue that they could get the residency uh, visa for that all right and uh we want to go to prayer this evening and uh i'm gonna have brother pole will come if you would john uh i'm gonna have him come and he'll lead us in our prayer this evening and um unite our hearts together in prayer and um brother john will lead us and as he leads us audibly let's pray along with him silently and uh unite together in prayer this evening all right brother pole label Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us where we can come in into the church here and hear the word of God preached. And we pray that we not only hear the word, but be doers of the word. And we thank you for the preacher that you give us here. And we ask that you would be with him and his wife. And we do pray for the, uh, the way that things are going to, in the church now. There's a lot of things that are coming up. And we pray that each one of us be on our places and, and plan to attend those things that are coming up. And we ask that you would be with our missionaries now that are in foreign countries and around the world. We just pray that you would uh, give them a special blessing at this time of the year. It becomes very important to them as, uh, as it is us, to us as the holidays approach. And we just pray that you would give them the comfort they need, the one that needs the permanent visa. We pray that you would intervene here. And take care of this situation, and that uh, that they would see God's working hands in this area here. And we pray that you'd be with them that are over there, that they'd continue to go on. And we do pray for our other missionaries that you'd help them, give them the rest they need, and give them the wisdom and the knowledge that they need from the Word of God, to, so that they can preach it to those that have not heard. And we pray that you'd help us here at the church that we'd be uh, able to do the work of getting out the word to those around the church and we thank you for those that are involved in this and we just ask that you'd continue to help them we thank you for the ministries that we have here at the church and we just pray that you'd uh, help us to get uh, those that uh, would be able to work in those ministries to do the job that you want us to do and we thank you for that and we ask you, thank you for our military that is uh, serving us here at the country, and we pray that you'd give them the, uh, the ability to uh, have good, clear minds when they're dealing with certain things, and we ask that you'd protect them and uh, bless them and bring them back home, and we ask that you'd be with uh, those who are on the list of cancer. We pray that you'd help them and uh, give them comfort at this time and, and throughout the days and nights that they have, and we pray that you'd help them now. We pray for our, our uh, those in the list of those that are unsaved we just pray that we like the pastor said someone would come across the past that they would listen to and that they would see that uh, now is the time that they need to get salvation and get it in their hearts and we ask that you would uh, be with the unreached uh, the 1040s and all those that are not have not had a bible in their language and we pray that you would help those that are involved to continue to continue working to get a Bible so that they can have a Bible in front of them and that they can read it as well as being here at Priest. We thank you for those that are involved in this. We ask that you would help them now. We also pray for the 
those are on a sick list, and so basically the brother Bob and his the family there that you'd help them at this time of the sister passing on. We ask that you'd help them now, and that uh, everything would go the way that you'd want them to go. And we do pray that you continue to bless here at the church the giving of uh, God's word and out, and also the giving of uh, the money that you've uh, given to us to give back to the end. We ask that you'd help us. Tonight, to be your cheerful givers as the plates are passed. And if there's someone here tonight that does not know you as Lord and Savior, we pray that tonight would be that night that you touched hearts and that they would uh, receive you as Lord and Savior. We pray now that you'd be with the remainder of the service and the song singing and everything like that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, would you turn with me again to number 180180? Be not just made whatever be tied. God will take care of you. Let's all stand together once as we sing 180 together on that first. Be not just made whatever be tied. God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide. God will take care of you. God will take care of you through every day or all the way. He will take care of you. God will take care of you through days of toil and hard done fail. one another. Make somebody feel welcome, especially our guests. We'll come back and sing that last stanza together.
matter what may be the test, God will take care of you. Let's sing that last together. No matter what may be the test, God will take care of you. Lean weary ones upon his breast, God will take care of you. God will take care of you through every day or all the way. He will take care of you. God will take care of you. All right, good singing. You can be seated. Ushers will come and we'll get our offering tonight and we're going to begin to uh, take some offerings on Wednesday night, heading for our Thanksgiving dinner day, the dinner day Sunday on November 16th this year. And uh, that is only, what, six, seven Sundays from now and uh, from this coming Sunday. So it's uh, going to be here before we know it. 92 days left in the whole year. And uh, so things are coming upon us quickly. So uh, we want to prepare uh, for that. And uh, let's ask the Lord's, I'm sorry. The tent, yeah, just leave it up there. <laughs> and, uh, so, and be, be careful out there, by the way, with the, the tent and everything. Nobody get hurt. Watch where you're walking. And uh, don't trip over any tent pegs or anything. All right. And uh, let's pray. We'll ask God's blessing on the offering tonight. Father, thank you for the privilege that's ours to give. And Father, thank you for your goodness to us. Uh, you have given all of us far more than what we deserve. We love you. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege to give back to the work of God. And I pray, Lord, that for this offering tonight as we prepare for the Thanksgiving dinner day, Lord, you will have your hand upon the invitations as they go out, the visits as they're made. The, I pray that folks will come that day and we'll have numbers of people receive Christ as their Savior as a result of that special day. So, Lord, we ask your blessing on our giving towards that. In Jesus' name, amen. Take your Bible this evening if you would. You got that going? All right. Take your Bible to James chapter 3, please. James chapter 3. <clears throat> James 3, beginning of verse number 1. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths, that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great, 
and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and, it, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beast, and of birds, and of serpents, and of things in the sea is tamed, and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Father, add your blessing to the reading of the Scripture tonight, and Lord, the other Scriptures we'll look to this evening in the course of our study. And Father, I pray that you would give us all ears to hear this evening what you would want to say to your church. Lord, this is a vital subject when it comes to our Christian maturity. And I pray, Lord, you, thy Holy Spirit would have his way in each heart and life. Help us to focus. Lord, help us to put out of our mind things that would occupy us and would grab our attention and would keep us from hearing what you wanted to say to each of us this evening. May you help us and honor the, the, the study of your word here this evening. And accomplish your will in our lives. It's in Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. Who likes going to the doctor? That's what I thought. I, nobody enjoys that. A little girl raised her hand, but uh, she won't count. But no, nobody says, oh, it's my annual physical. I can't wait. Nobody says that. Nobody likes going to the doctor. Now, you do, how many of you like it when you leave the doctor's office and he has told you, you are healthy and you're good to go for, you know, yeah, I think, hey, that's good. Uh, he looked under the hood and everything's okay. And uh, you think I'm good for another 100,000 miles and, and, and that's good. Now, listen, tonight's going to kind of like, it's going to be kind of like going to the doctor's office, okay? You're probably not going to enjoy it too much, but I hope by the end that you'll say, I think I see what I need to do to be healthy as a Christian. By the way, how many of you left the doctor's office and he gave you a prescription or he told you some instructions that he wanted you to follow and you left with the, with, with the determination you were going to do exactly as he told you to do? Hmm? You ever done that? Sure. We all do that. And uh, if that's what he says to do, that's what we're going to do. That's why we went to him in the first place, right? And uh, I hope it'll be that way with God's Word. I hope that when you go to the Word of God and you see what God tells you to do, you'll be just as determined to do it as you are when you want to follow the doctor's orders. Uh, Because these are God's orders. And we want to follow them in order to be healthy as a Christian. In fact, James says something very interesting here. He says, if many men... Look at verse number 2 of James 3. For in many things we offend all, but if any man offend not in word, notice the same is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. God said, the, here James says, the Christian who is able to tame his tongue is a perfect Christian. Now, understand the word perfect. It doesn't mean sinless. But perfect in the Bible means complete. It means consummate. It means without def, not defective at all. And, and so the whole thing, you know, when I was younger and we had a, we had a general practitioner that we would go to as a doctor, um, and, and by the way, he used to come to the house if we needed him to, and, um, and, and, and it, you believe that? And it, it, one of the things I always remember about going to his office and, and, and old Doc Ziegler, and on his desk would always be a, a jar, and in that jar were these large sticks. And uh, they, he would always, first thing he ever did was he'd pull one of them out and he'd say, all right, open your mouth and say, ah. And he'd put that tongue depressor down there and he'd always look at your throat, look at your tongue. Because the doctor, you could tell a lot about somebody's health by looking at their tongue. Did you know you can tell a lot about your spiritual health by looking at your tongue or listening to your tongue? And so I'm going to help us tonight to tame the tongue. I'm going to help us tonight uh, to guard our tongue and to be careful 
about what we speak. And I'm going to use an acronym, all right? And it's going to be the word THINK. Always a good thing to do, especially before you engage the tongue. And um, THINK, okay? That's the word we're going to use. And let's start with the letter T, all right? The letter T stands for TRUE. T-R-U-E. Is it TRUE? Someone said, remember this rule about gossip, the more interesting it is, or the more interesting it is, the more likely it is to be false. Okay? You think about when it comes to is it true? How do you determine whether something's true? Let's say, let's say for instance, I'm uh, going to do marriage counseling with a, with a couple that maybe is having a, a troubled marriage. And I say, all right, I'm going to listen to the wife first. And so I take 30 minutes and I listen to the wife and she explains to me the, the situation. And then uh, I, I hear that side of the story and I say, okay, uh, that's all I need to hear. I don't listen to the husband. I don't listen to anybody else. I just say, all right, I, I heard what I wanted to hear. I've made my decision. Would I be a good counselor? No, I would not be a good counselor. Why? Because I only heard one side of the story. So I got to bring the husband in and I got to listen to his side of the story. And then you understand there's her side of the story, his side of the story, and then there's the truth somewhere between the two. There's three sides usually to every story. And, and here's the thing. We, we have to understand when we see a situation and we're going to make a judgment on the situation, you have to remember something. We always only know half of the situation. The Bible says man looks on the outward appearance. All right? God looks on the heart. Okay? So we never know. Now when you say, well, I know what they were thinking, you're lying. You don't know what they're thinking. I know what their, their motive was. No, you don't know what their motive was. You know, sometimes you don't even know what your own motive is. You don't know your heart that well. Your heart can deceive you. We can't see. Nobody has the x-ray vision and look into someone else's heart. You can't do that. And so you have to make sure you get all sides of the story. And only God is the one that's able to do that. So you want to you make sure that something is true. The couple of scriptures I want you to, to look at with me, all right? First, go back to the book of Psalms. Would you turn there, please? Psalms is the big book, right in about the middle of the Old Testament. And look at Psalm 15. Would you go there, please? Psalm 15. You're going to be looking at some scripture this evening. But that's what's going to change your life. All right? Psalm 15, notice verse number 2. That verse, verse 1 says, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle, and who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly, and worketh righteousness, and speaketh the truth in his heart. Notice, he that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor in whose eyes a vile person is contemned, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. Now, I'm saying, listen, we, we speak the truth in our heart. We don't backbite with our tongue. We don't talk about someone behind their back. If you have something you want to say to someone, you say it to them. See, and you make sure, is it, is it true? Is it true? Look at Proverbs chapter 12, right after the book of Psalms is the book of Proverbs. Turn over there and look at Proverbs 12, please. Proverbs 12, and notice verse number 22. The Bible says there, lying lips, Proverbs 12, 22, lying lips are abomination to the Lord, but they that deal truly are His delight. So you always have to, to make sure, do I know this to be true? John 7, 24, God said, Judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Appearances can be deceiving. And you can get things wrong. Now go to the New Testament with me, over to the book of Ephesians. Would you look there, please? Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, right between Galatians and Philippians of Ephesians. Notice chapter 4 with me, please. Again, he's talking about what we know to be true. In verse 15, he says this, 
but speaking the truth in love may grow up into Him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Speaking the truth in love. How many times you heard somebody say, well, now I'm not sure this is true, but this is what I heard. Ever hear statements like that? Now I'm not sure about this, but, but this is what so-and-so told me. Huh? Then, then listen, not only does a gossip... Listen, a gossip is not just a tongue. A gossip has to have an ear to listen to. Them. And you've got to provide a, gossip, a listening ear to the gossiping tongue. And if you, by chance, listen, if, and I'll talk about how to avoid that, but if you hear something that you're not sure is true, but you get, a, you get wind of that, listen, did you know you're not obligated to pass it along? Did you know that you don't have to pass along everything you hear? You're not, in fact, if you do, you're just as guilty as the one who started it in the first place. So, I'm responsible for what I hear, and I'm responsible for what I pass along. Now, the Bible says, The north wind driveth away rain, so doth an angry countenance a backbiting tongue. So, what do you do when someone wants to, to gossip to you, or you say something, or wants to say something to you about somebody else. And let me, let me clear it up. If, if you're not part of the problem, and you're not part of the solution, then you don't need to know anything about it. Okay? Because then it's gossip. Alright? And, and so, what you want to do is a couple of things. If, if somebody came up to me and said, uh, if Quentin came up to me and said, man, I tell you what, I gotta, uh, that's Scotty Reeves, you know? And, and I said, wait, 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 wait. Let me, let me get Scotty right now and we'll talk to him about whatever he got a problem with. Oh, well, no, no, no. I've not, it's nothing. Hmm? And all of a sudden he doesn't want to tell me. Or I can immediately tell him, yeah, Scotty, boy, isn't he a wonderful guy? Let me tell you what I really appreciate about him. Hmm? I mean, just, just, just take control and, and stop it right in its tracks. Or you could say, one guy said, I think you ought to say, uh, no, wait a minute, before you say anything, are you sure I can quote you on this? I don't know how many times through the years have people come to me and say, now, somebody told me this, Pastor. I'm not going to tell you who told me it. Well, listen, if you, if you listen to it, you ought to be able to say who told it to you. Okay? And, and, and listen, you, you, it's just a matter of is it true? And do you know it to be true? Now, we're going to come to some other things here, but the first thing is true. And, and listen, if you say, but preacher, if I shut people down like that, I'll never hear anything. That's the idea. And you'll be much happier that way. Okay? Is it true? Now, let's go to H. Because this, this falls into it, not only is it true, but is it helpful? H stands for helpful. In other words, will what I'm about to say bring about a solution to the problem? If I'm part of the problem or part of the solution, are my words going to help bring a solution to the problem? One parent told her children, your words are either flames or they're flowers. It was helping your children get a mental picture that I can either plant beautiful flowers with my words or I can unleash a raging fire with my words. That is very difficult. In fact, James says that fire is set on fire of hell. And it's a raging fire that is very difficult to put out. And would you realize that our words we say either help or they hurt? The words we say either help or they hurt. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but what? Words can never harm me. How many of you still believe that? How many understand words hurt? There's some people, listen... There's some sitting in this room tonight that are still battling words that have been said to you through the years that have wounded you and hurt you deeply. And you're still trying to get past those things because somebody wounded you with words. The Bible talks about the wounds of the tail bearer. They, the, the, the words of the tail bearer are like wounds. They go down to the innermost part of the belly. They're deep wounds. 
takes much time to, to heal. And so you have to be careful. What is Ephesians 4? If you're still in Ephesians 4, look at verse number 29. Notice what the Bible says. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. I want to make sure that the communication I have come in my mouth is, my mouth is going to help somebody and build somebody up, not tear them down. So I say, is it true? Is it helpful? Just because it's true, if it's not helpful, I don't have to say it. You don't have to repeat bad truth. The Bible talks about, listen, if a, uh, it, it's, it's interesting. Brother Currington, those of you in RU will remember the illustration he uses of his little girl who uh, got dressed, he got her all dressed up on a Sunday morning, remember, and had her all in a nice dress and pump hair fixed just right and everything real good. And he was getting himself ready and she went outside. It had rained the night before and she ended up getting in the mud and getting all messed up. And he got to the top of the stairs and she was at the bottom of the stairs crying, Daddy, Daddy. And he looked at her and she goes, Oh, Daddy, I went outside. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Forgive me. And of course he said, I forgave her. But he said, I brought her upstairs, took that muddy dress off took those socks off, shoes off, put her back in the bathtub, cleaned her all up, fixed her hair back up in those ponytails, put a brand new dress on her and socks and shoes, and then took her to Sunday school. He said, you know why? He said, so you, you forgave her for going outside, absolutely. Well, why'd you change her and clean her up and do all that? He said, because nobody at Sunday school needed to know that she fell in the mud. See? That's all done. That's all forgiven. See? And they don't need to know that. <clears throat> don't, don't feel like... Uh, you, you have to uh, tell somebody about uh, the past that God has forgiven you for and God has cleansed you from and you feel like, well, i got to talk about this with everybody. No, you don't. No, you don't. That's been gone. That's been cleansed. And that's been forgiven. You say, yeah, but it's true. Yeah, but it's not, it's not helpful. See? It's not, it's not going to be kind. And it's not what you should do. So is it so, so T is true, H is helpful, I is inspiring. I stands for inspiring. And this goes along with the last verse we read about building people up. Your word's going to build somebody up. Proverbs 12, 18 says, There is it speaketh like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is health. There, there are those who can talk and it's like getting stuck with a sword. You ever have somebody say something to you, and even, even in joking or even in sarcasm, you say, hey, that hurt. And, and you, you, kind of, you may smile a little bit, but you know what? It hurt. And words can be like swords that hurt. And, and, and he says, there are people that speak like that, but he said, the tongue of the wise is health. When you're around someone who, who, who has their tongue under control and as their, has tamed the tongue, then you find out that being around them, you feel better. You ever you be around people and you just go away from them and you, felt, you feel refreshed? And you say, boy, I really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed being with them. See, that's how it ought to be when folks are around us. Our tongue ought to be health. They ought to feel healthier and, and better because they were around us. The Bible says heaviness in the heart of a man makes it stoop, but a good word maketh it glad. Instead of, instead of looking at somebody when you see that they're heavy with a burden and they're kind of, kind of burdened down with something, instead of saying, hey, what's wrong with you? What's your problem? Huh? Why don't you try to encourage them? Why don't you try to give them a good word? Hmm? A good word can make it glad. Sometimes a word can just make somebody's day just by speaking to them a good word. That's why the Bible says a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in pictures of silver. Are you still in Ephesians? Um, uh, go to the book of Colossians. Would you look there? Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Colossians 4. Colossians 4. Oh, you're enjoying the doctor's visit, I can tell. 
It's real quiet in here. Notice Colossians 4 and verse 5. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. Now here it is. Let your speech be always with grace. Season with salt that ye may know how you ought to answer every man. Notice it says, let your speech be always with grace. Grace. Grace is undeserved favor. That means I don't need to talk to someone like they deserve, but I want to talk to them like they don't deserve. Grace. Grace. Let your speech be sometimes with grace. Always with grace. That's a challenge, isn't it? I read where a boy had a birthmark and his dad told him, you know what, son, I'm glad you have that birthmark. That's how I find you in a crowd. And a little boy told, told when he got away from his dad, he told one man, he said this, I feel sorry for people without a birthmark like mine. Huh? What happened? What changed that boy's perspective? His father's words to him. Are your words building others up? Being health to somebody else? Being inspiration to someone else? Or are they destroying others? The Bible says if they edify, and edifice is something you build up, and every word we speak is going to build up or it's going to tear down. There's no, you're not going to have any in between. How are your words? What we say. T-H-I. We're three-fifths through your exam. Let's go to N. This comes to the word necessary. Is it necessary? In other words, hey, you know what you've got to ask yourself? Do I need to say anything at all? Do I need to say anything at all? David said, Psalm 141, verse 3, Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. And by the way, you won't control your tongue. The tongue can no man tame. But it is tameable. But you got to have help. And here's the secret. God set a guard over my mouth. Don't let me say what I shouldn't say. Proverbs 10 and verse 19, In the multitude of words there wanteth not sin, but he that refraineth his lips is wise. In the multitude of words there wanteth not sin. The more you say, the more opportunity you'll have to sin. What am I hearing? Oh, the kid's downstairs. Okay, all right. It's an invasion from outer space. I want to know where they're coming from. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 5. Would you turn there, please? 1 Timothy chapter 5. Is it necessary? Do I need to say anything at all? 1 Timothy 5. He's talking here particularly about widows, but it's, I think, an appliable and applicable to any of us. He says in verse number 13, he says, And withal they learn to be idle wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but what? Tattlers also and busybodies speaking things which they ought not. When you become idle, they used to always say an idle mind is the devil's workshop. You get idle, and you become a tattler, you become a busybody, 
in other people's matters. And you know what happens when that happens? You say things you ought never to say. Is it necessary for me to say this? James 1 and verse 19 says, Let every man be swift to hear and slow to speak. Do you ever think God gave us two of these and only one of these? Maybe we should listen twice as much as we use this. Calvin Coolidge was a president that was known for not saying very many words. Because he made this statement. He said, I've never been hurt by anything I didn't say. I've never been hurt by anything I didn't say. Sometimes people say, well, Richard, I'm just, just the way I am. I just speak my mind. I mean, if I, if I think it, I say it. You don't want to say that. The Bible says, the fool uttereth all his mind. So you don't want to identify yourself as that. And it shows that you have, you're not giving the Lord any control in your life at all. One such man said to John Wesley once, Mr. Wesley, I pride myself in speaking my mind. That's my talent. Mr. Wesley responded to him, well, the Lord wouldn't mind if you buried that talent. I think that's pretty wise. There was a woman who had a serious throat condition and the doctor told her the vocal cords needed total rest. So she was forbidden to talk for six months. Now with a husband and six children, that seemed like an impossible task, but she did what she was told. When she needed the kids, she blew a whistle. Whenever she needed to communicate, she wrote things on pads of paper. After six months, her voice came back. When asked what it was like to communicate only in writing, she said this, You'd be surprised how many notes I crumbled up and threw into the trash before I gave them to anyone. Seeing my words before anyone heard them had an effect on me I don't think I'll ever forget. wonder why David said, I'll, I'll watch and put a guard over my mouth. Like putting a muzzle over the, over the, the dog. A dog who barks all the time, you'd put a muzzle over him and they, they, they can't make noise. Some Christians need to put a muzzle on it. And allow God to help you to be able to say less, not more. You feel like, boy, people just don't listen to what I say. Maybe because you're saying something all the time. There's some people that when they finally say something, everybody wants to hear what they got to say because they don't ever offer much. They don't ever say very much. And so when they speak, we want to listen to what they have to say. So, is it necessary? Is what I'm going to say necessary to say? And then let's go to K. And that is it kind. Are my words based on a desire to help? In Proverbs 31, when it talks about the virtuous woman in Proverbs 31, it says the law of kindness is in her mouth. The law of kindness is in her mouth. If what I'm about to say does not put someone in a kind light, then why would I say it? Is it kind? Someone said that great minds will discuss ideas, average minds will discuss events, and small minds will discuss people. That's why really, when, when you call somebody on the telephone, and by the way, when you call someone on the telephone or you meet somebody for a, a lunch or a meal, you ought to have a plan for what that conversation is going to be about. Otherwise, it's just idle time and you'll become busybodies and speak things 
that you ought not to speak. Don't bow your head, it's not time to pray. It's true. It's true. Back to the book of James, where we started this evening. James is writing here to these believers. Remember, the first two words of chapter 3, what are they? My brethren. Talking to believers here. He's not talking to unsaved people here. And he says, out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. These things ought not so to be. You got, you're, you're, you're saying good things to somebody on one hand and then you're tearing them up on the other hand. He says, that's not supposed to be that way. The Bible says in Psalm 12, 3, the Lord shall cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaketh proud things. What's Proverbs 15, 1 say? A soft answer turneth away wrath but grievous words will stir up anger. How's your answers? Ah, they started it. Can you give a soft answer? Or will you choose the grievous words that will stir up more anger? Can you, can you say, now I want my speech to be with grace? I want to say something that will edify. And by the way, if I can't do that, then I reply the rule, is it necessary for me to say anything right now? Used to say, used to say, if you can't say something nice, then don't say anything at all. Isn't it amazing how much we know that never seems to translate to come out? The tongue is an unruly evil. Romans 3 and verse 13, talking about the unsaved man, the unregenerate man. The Bible says, Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips. How many of you know that, that the, the tongue can be a deadly weapon? You ever, anybody, don't raise your hand. You ever had a, what, what they call a tongue lashing from somebody? You ever heard that expression? Huh? Some of you probably experienced that. You say, man, I got a tongue. I, I, some may have given a few to people. You can cut somebody up pretty good just using your tongue. I want to show you something. In Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. Are you doing okay? You're almost ready. I'm ready, just, just about ready to leave you and let you get dressed and go home. The exam will be over. But Luke 6. Luke 6 is sort of Luke's account here of the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus gave. <clears throat> Remember, K stands for being kind. Notice what Jesus said here in verse 35 of Luke chapter 6. Love your enemies and do good and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great. And ye shall be the children of the highest. Now here's, here's the phrase. Did you, ever, did you ever realize this before? For He is kind unto who? The unthankful and to the evil. You know something? I don't have any problem being kind to people who are kind to me. Do you have a hard time being kind to people who are unthankful? Do you have a problem being kind to people who are just flat out evil? Jesus was kind. God is kind to the unthankful and to the evil. That's incredible. Let me give you a conclusion. Five, five statements here. Number one, God does not look favorably 
upon the gossip. Leviticus 19 verse 16 says, Thou shalt not go up and down as a talebearer among thy people. Neither shalt thou stand against the blood of thy neighbor. I am the Lord. Number two, an unchecked tongue may reveal an unsaved heart. An unchecked tongue may reveal an unsaved heart. The Bible says in James 1.26, If any of you seem to be religious and bridles not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. What's vain? Empty. Nothing to it. Because number three, a look into the mouth may reveal heart disease. I want you to turn to Matthew 12. You're in Luke 6. Take a left there. Go past Mark and go to Matthew. This is where we'll probably end up. Matthew 12. You okay? Matthew 12? You don't want to say anything, do you? Matthew 12. Verse 34, Jesus speaking, O generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Your mouth will reveal the condition of your heart. Somebody does something and they let go with a swear word. They say, oh, I don't know where that came from. Yeah, you do. It came from your heart. Because it's out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. Hey, I could follow you around for three, four days, and if I had a, a recorder and I could just record your words for three or four days, I can tell you after listening to your conversation for three or four days what's in your heart. Because what's in your heart is what you talk about. Tell me what you talk about, I can tell you what's in your heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Now here's one that's incredible. Number four, God's recorder is running. You might say the red light is on. Let's keep reading Matthew 12. Verse 35, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. That's a frightening thing. That's an incredible thing. Because I would probably venture to say all of us are careless with our words. Not thinking that we're going to hear those again someday. Parent, have you ever had the experience of saying something or having an expression that you used and you thought it was okay until you heard your child begin to say it? And then you heard it and you said, man, that doesn't sound so good. Sounds different when it's coming from someone else's lips, especially your children. How sad it will be to hear it come from when we're standing before God. Judgment. Number five, I can save myself a lot of grief. So can you. Why? Proverbs 21, 23. Whoso keepeth his mouth and his tongue keepeth his soul from troubles. Whoso keepeth his mouth and his tongue will keep his soul from trouble. The less I say, the less opportunity to get into trouble. And this is, listen... This is difficult for Americans, American Christians 
in our day and age. And I'll tell you why. Because we are, we are driven to have an opinion about everything. The, the, the game, that Saturday Buckeye game is at 3.30. It'll be over about 6.30 or 7 o'clock and they'll open the phones up for three more hours for everybody to give their opinion. Well, here's what Myers should do. Here's what the coach ought to do. Here's what quarterback ought to do. This is what they ought to run. This is what the offensive coordinator. Everybody got to give their opinion. When there's a presidential debate, oh, then we're going to open it up and get your opinions. You think any of those guys, do you think they care what your opinion is? But we feel like we got to, and what happens is we carry that over then in every area of our life and we want to get an opinion about everything. And we think everybody wants to hear what we got to say. And that's not true. You can save yourself a lot of grief. You'll keep your soul from trouble if you ask God to help you tame your tongue. Number six, I want to please the Lord in everything. Psalm 19, verse 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in Thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Words and heart linked together again. Ask God to help you with your tongue. John Wesley was preaching. He's wearing a new bow tie with two streamers hanging down from it. There was a woman in the meeting who apparently didn't hear anything in the message but sat with a long face. As soon as the service was over, she came right up to Mr. Wesley and said, Will you suffer a little criticism? And he said, Yes. Well... Mr. Wesley, she said, your bow tie is too long and it's an offense to me. He said, have you a pair of shears? And after receiving the shears, he handed them to her saying he would, that she would know how they would look best. And she reached over and clipped off the streamers of his bow tie. And he said to her, is that alright now? She said, yes, that is much better. And then he said, do you mind me having those shears? Would you mind a little criticism? She said, he said, ma'am, your tongue is a great offense to me. If you don't mind sticking it out, I'd like to take some off. I tell you, think, think. If we just think, before we speak. And this, it, listen, this is, this is the maturity. The maturity of the Christian life is, and I can quote seven chapters of the Bible. The maturity of the Christian life is, and I can, uh, you know, uh, look a certain way or act a certain way or dress a certain way. The maturity of the Christian life is when I can allow God to control what comes out of my mouth. Until I get to that point, I'm not a mature Christian. So T, true. H, helpful. I, inspiring. N, necessary. And K, kind. Think before we speak. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Let's stand together for prayer, shall we? Father, take the truth now this evening. Thank you for everyone's attention tonight. Lord, this is, this is always very convicting. When we look at what you say makes a perfect Christian, a complete Christian. If we're honest before you, we all fall short in this area. We would ask you to help us tonight to guard our tongues, to put a watch over our mouths. 
You would help us that no corrupt communication proceed out of that mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it would minister grace, undeserved favor to other people. So, Father, help us to be swift to hear and slow to speak. Help us to take the Bible we've learned tonight as Brother Paul Abel prayed that we'd be doers of the Word and not hearers only. Don't let us walk out the door and there be no change in the way we talk. No change in the things we say. Lord, may it impact us. May we yield ourselves to You and ask You to put this tongue under control. That what comes out would be helpful would would be health to others and not hurtful and try to destroy others. We trust you to help us. And we ask for your help in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, let's sing together. Isn't he wonderful, wonderful? Isn't Jesus my Lord wonderful? You got it? Uh, isn't he wonderful, wonderful, wonderful? Isn't Jesus my Lord wonderful? I said, see, ears have heard, it's recorded in God's Word. Isn't Jesus my Lord wonderful? We're going to need to have some help, some of the men. If, um, did you turn this off? Is this still on? Okay. Some of the fellas, we got to split the chairs. So we have a middle aisle for the wedding. So if some of you men who know what that's about, I think you guys got it down pretty good now. Uh, if we could do that uh, when we empty the auditorium, we get that split up, that would be a great help to the Moreland's have that all set for the wedding. Okay? God bless you. You're dismissed. Mm-hmm.